We're going to be continuing our sermon series on the work that our vision team did. And today we're going to be talking about the authority of Scripture. And our passage today comes from the book of 2 Timothy, um, chapter 3, verses 10 through chapter 4, verse 6. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them up and, and, and read along with me. Hear these words from scripture. But you have paid attention to my teaching, conduct, purpose, faithfulness, patience, love, and endurance. You have seen me experience physical abuse and ordeals in places such as Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. I put up with all sorts of abuse, and the Lord rescued me from it all. In fact, anyone who wants to live a holy life in Christ Jesus will be harassed. But evil people and swindlers will grow even worse as they deceive others while being deceived themselves. But you must continue with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you. Since childhood, you have known the holy scriptures that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character, so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready to do Be ready to do it, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, and encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances, endure suffering, do the work of a preacher of the good news, and carry out your service fully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jason. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, for this, uh, this beautiful day. It's beautiful uh, because we're here and because you're here. And so we ask, God, that you would pour your spirit on us as we hear your word about your word this morning. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, do you remember the first Bible you ever received? Which I think back to that time. Maybe you haven't received a Bible. If you haven't, uh, the Bibles we have in the seats out there, you can take one with you. That can be your first Bible, a paperback Bible. You can say you got it from here. But a lot of us got Bibles when we were kids, and uh, we give out Bibles to third graders here at uh, Tri Lakes, and that's when I got my Bible as a kid in third grade. And uh, I actually wanted one earlier because I, I was an early reader. That's part of a product of being a nearsighted kid. Your world is kind of right here. So, so I read a lot, and, and uh, I look forward to getting that Bible. And I remember that first Bible. I don't have it anymore, but it was a, a, a small Bible that had lots of pictures in it. And I love to look at the pictures of all the biblical stories as I was reading along with the text. The the Bible I remember most, though, is my mom's Bible, and I still have it. This is a, uh, uh, weighs about four tons, and uh, it's, it was called the Layman's Parallel Bible. So essentially, in the 70s, they put this Bible together before you could get 80 Bibles on your, on your computer. Four Bibles in one Bible, four different translations. And uh, I opened this up last night, and there were bulletins in here from the 1970s uh, that my mom had saved. And she used to carry this around to the Bethel Bible Study Series. She did every Thursday night. And it was also very useful uh, at times uh, with the kids. Now, I also still have the Bible I carried as a teenager in youth group. It was a New American Standard Bible, and uh, it's fallen apart in the back. There are a lot of places in here where I was at camp or on a mission trip or I underlined things with a with a uh, sort of a crayon-like highlighter. And um, there's a note in the back from a girl I liked at the time, even though uh, she didn't like me as much. And um, there's also the maps, and I love the maps. And one of the maps, you could tell I was really bored on a Sunday morning because I drew a battleship in the, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So 
So this is, I keep this around just for sentimental reasons. And, and the one Bible I really like now is this one. I got it uh, last year. Um, I wanted a Bible that I could carry with me that was easy to carry around. Um, this is uh, a Cambridge edition. So it's, it's a little bit, I, it was a gift to myself. Um, it's uh, goat skin leather. So it, it just has that great Bible smell to it, you know, and, and it stays open. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's really an awesome Bible. You can take a look at that later if you want to. And it's one of, I don't know how many Bibles I have in my office. I think every preacher has a ton of different Bibles. I have the one that uh, they gave me at ordination, which uh, ironically is falling apart, uh, just crumbling. Uh, I don't know what that means, but, but there it is, signed by the bishop. I think they got the cheapest binding possible. Here, go preach the word and wear it out. So I've done that. Um, I've got the Logos Bible program on my computer, which has 200 different English versions of the Bible on it, and uh, plus the Greek and the Hebrew, and you can read through all the different texts. So that's one of the things that I love about my job is I, I get paid to read and study the scriptures. It's a, it's a marvelous thing, and so that collection is very valuable to me, as are all my books. But it's not about the volume of Bibles that you have. You probably have more than one. Um, it's about falling in love with the scripture. As a kid, I remember memorizing verses out of my Bible, and I grew to love it and be challenged by it. Seminary increased that love for the Bible. A lot of people go to seminary and say to themselves, well, I didn't want to study it in that much detail. I mean, we had to diagram sentences and do it in the Greek and all that kind of stuff, but I love that stuff. It was such a, a way of opening the Bible to me in a way I had never thought about it before. And I always realized there's more to learn. I mean, you read familiar passages over and over again, and somehow the Holy Spirit shows you something you've never seen before. And I count on that, especially every Christmas. Christmas is two months from now, people. Did you get, are you on board with that? Because we are. And uh, Luke 2 is going to happen again, and Mary and Joseph are going to go to Bethlehem again, and they're going to be shepherds again, and there's going to be a manger again. And every year at Christmas, I go, please, God, show me something new out of this text, because I can't say the same thing all the time. And believe it or not, somehow, somehow there's always something new. So pray for that to happen again this year, <laughs> right? Because we're coming up on 30, okay? So there's a lot of different ways to look at the text. And I, I love this because there's a hunger when we get into the scriptures. When we really read them, there's something that drives us. They become part of who we are. Instead of reading them, they begin to read us. The problem is that most Christians have Bibles, but few have actually read them, particularly read them all the way through. How many of you have read the Bible all the way through? A few of you, yeah. Most of the time, when we read it, uh, we read it in piecemeal. And I think that's part of the theological crisis we see in the church today. It's a lack of biblical engagement. It's a biblical illiteracy. That's why when we were talking about our vision for the church, when our vision team met together, one of the questions we wanted to ask was about the engagement we have with the scripture, the engagement we have with the foundational documents of our faith. And you told us that biblical preaching was important. You told us that this was something that, that was valuable to you. We value hearing biblical teaching, but do we always value it enough to engage in the scriptures ourselves? So we wanted to put a stake in the ground that we are a church that sees scripture as our authority. And then we want to flesh out that vision in practice. And we're going to tell you how we're going to do that here in a minute. But that first part of our vision statement, if you remember, is that we are a church that is theologically traditional. Now, those words require some definition. Theology concerns God. It concerns what we believe about God, what we mean when we use the word God. So theology is incredibly important. So is tradition, because we recognize we don't do theology in a vacuum. I just don't do my own theology. I might mean, always find it interesting when people ask me, what is your theology of X? Well, the reality is my theology needs to be the church's theology. 
I have to work it out in that way in community with others. It's not just something I come up with on my own. Jason's been working on his ordination paperwork. And they ask all kinds of questions about what's your theology of X. And, and the right answer to me is always, it's what the scripture says. It's what our tradition says to us. That's what it means to be theologically traditional. But it's also a reality and a reminder that the Christian st faith stands or falls on its theology and its divine claims of divine revelation. We believe that God has spoken through his word and through the person of Jesus Christ. As John puts it in his gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we're not talking about a book that has just been dropped out of the sky, but rather one that has been lived out and fleshed out in person in Jesus Christ. That word is part of the greater story, the foundational story for who we are and who God is. And that story is disclosed to us through these sources. The primary one is Scripture. Now, John Wesley believed this. He called himself a man of one book. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only book that he read, but it was the primary book. It was the thing that held the source of life and faith for John Wesley and the early Methodist, the controlling story of God's revelation and grace in Jesus Christ. In Article 5 of the Articles of Religion, that Wesley borrowed from the Anglican Church that we still use today. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with our articles of religion because you spend all of your time in our book of discipline. How many of you even know we have a book of discipline? Well, some of you do. Uh, but uh, the articles of religion are there. Article 5 says this, Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary for salvation, so that whatsoever is not read within, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of faith or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. In other words, the scripture contains everything we need. Anything outside of that, we don't need as much. That's why Wesleyans say that Scripture is authoritative. It's the church's primary and final authority on all matters of faith and practice. Now, you may have heard about the Wesleyan quadrilateral, Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. That was a term coined not by John Wesley, but by Albert Outler, who was a, a Methodist theologian in the 1960s. And later in his life, he regretted coming up with this idea of quadrilateral because it suggested that Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience were all equal. That was not the case for John Wesley. Scripture was always primary. In fact, for Wesley, where Scripture and experience deviate, Wesley characterized Scripture as always trustworthy and experience as untrustworthy. So the Bible is our authority. And it's our authority, I think, in two senses. First, when we talk about biblical authority, and notice that in the United Methodist Church, we don't use words like inerrancy or infallibility. That's a whole other argument out there. We use the word authority. And one of the senses in which we talk about scriptural authority is the extent to which scripture makes binding claims on our lives. That scripture alters our worldview, our behavior. It alters our destiny. That we, it becomes the guide for our life and makes significant claims on who we are and what we do with our bodies, with our lives, what we do in community. And it can make those claims, secondly, because of the authority behind the scripture. That authority, we believe, is God himself. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed, says Paul, and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. As my friend David Watson puts it, he's the dean at, at United Theological Seminary in Ohio, he says, the Bible teaches us about God because it is from God. The Bible can teach us about life because it comes from the source of life. In this sense, the scripture is the canon for the church. That's C-A-N-O-N, not C-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, right? You've got to keep those straight Canon means rule or measuring rod. Now, there are 66 books in the Bible, and all those books work together to form a cohesive whole. This is something I never learned until I went to seminary. 
because he always studied the Bible in pieces and chunks and memorized different verses here and there. Never saw it as a complete whole from beginning to end. The Bible was not assembled by a cabal of bishops in a smoke-filled room, which is what the Da Vinci Code suggests happened in 325. Uh, Don't read that as history. There's a reason it's in the fiction section, okay? But rather, the Bible was developed over time because it was used, because these letters of Paul, the Gospels, the Old Testament were used by the people of God. And they began to see them as the measuring stick for all other texts. Every Christmas and Easter, we see Time Magazine come out with, hey, we found another, we found another text that should have been in the Bible, but it was rejected by the Bible. No, 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 no. Those are usually very late texts, second, third century, and the church rejected them because they didn't match what God had revealed from the very beginning and what the people closest to Jesus had revealed in their experience of him. Scripture is the product of the inspiration of God and the work of humans together. Again, not dropped from the sky, but a lived witness. God's word is worked out in the laboratory of human life, which is why it can speak with us in wisdom across time, why it's timeless, and why it continues to speak to us over and over again. It becomes the measuring stick by which we test ideas, by which we test the spirits, I always love what Charles Wesley said about the Scripture. It's very much in vogue today for people to say that the Spirit's moving in different directions. The Spirit has caused us to think new ways and and move beyond the Scripture. The Bible's incomplete in what it says. I always love to quote this Charles Wesley hymn where he says, Whate'er the Spirit speaks in me must with the written word agree. If not, I cast it all aside as Satan's voice or nature's pride drop the Bible, right? That's, that, that's an important distinction, that we always use the Scripture as the measuring stick. And that's why it's so vital for us, especially for the 2020 church. It's like an eye chart. It forces us to focus our vision, and it calls for us to refocus over time. It can, it can change, you know, our, our prescription for looking at life. We read it over time in community. We see it through the lens of tradition. It it takes a careful reading, though. It takes investment in study and prayerful listening to the Spirit. It takes good interpretive strategy. It takes a contextual reading because, as we know, here we go, a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to say. Very good, very good. If you've learned nothing else in 10 years, you got that. That's awesome. The scripture is part of a healthy church. And when the church reads the scripture well, it begins to reflect the way of Christ. The one to whom the scriptures are always pointing. I think one of the reasons the church struggles today, one of the reasons we're in decline, is that when we have read the scripture, if we have read it at all, we've not read it as authoritative. We've read it piecemeal rather than as a whole. We've read it as little tweetable quotes, not as the grand story that orders our lives. One of the reasons we do that is because in the 16th century, when the Bible began to be printed, uh, when Gutenberg invented the printing press and the Bible began to be printed, mass-produced, they began to put chapters and verses into the Scripture so that people could find them for easy reference. That's a good thing. But the problem was, when you put those chapters and verses in there, that's an interpretive move in and of itself. And it causes you to look at these things in short pieces rather than seeing it as the whole. We begin to emphasize different parts, some more important than others. There are parts of the scripture that we might skip over completely because they don't look that interesting. How many of you love Leviticus, for example, right? But there's a lot of stuff in Leviticus we need to know. How about Habakkuk and Haggai, right? Uh, How about the book of Hezekiah? Let me do an experiment. I want you to open your Bible now. Grab the Bible, open it up to the book of Hezekiah. Go ahead and do that. I'll wait while you do that. You might have to look into the table of contents to find it. Go ahead and look. I see you looking. Book of Hezekiah, chapter 6, verse 18. 
where it says, God helps those who help themselves. Go ahead and find it. I'll wait while you get there. Are you there? Have you found it? Let me stop you. There is no book of Hezekiah. And nowhere in the scripture does it says God helps those who help themselves. That's Benjamin Franklin, not the scriptures. Okay? So I got you there. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the scriptures enough to know when a preacher is telling you a bunch of garbage? We need to learn the scriptures. We need to read the parts that we're not that familiar with. All scripture is God-breathed. That's one of the reasons why we love to preach through whole books of the Bible, even the weird stuff. I mean, we preach through Daniel, and most preachers will preach through Daniel 1 to 6 because it's got really good moralistic stories that we can grab onto, but skip chapter 7 to 12 because they're weird. But not us, because we're weird, and we want to dive into that stuff. And we're going to drag you along with us whether you want to go or not. You're going to have to look at it. In fact, it's the weird stuff in the Bible that often teaches us the most. The Bible doesn't hold anything back from us. You'll notice if you read the scripture, it is not a puppies and rainbows document. It's about real life. It's about God getting dirty in the midst of humanity. It's about being in the blood and muck of what it means to be human in life and death. That's why I think to see revival in the church, we need a revival of scripture reading and scriptural authority. But to do that, we've got to actually read it. A study by the Pew Forum, a recent study says this, mainline Protestants, which includes the United Methodist Church, 30% of mainline Protestants read the Bible at least once a week. 30%. 44% read it seldom or never. That means they're showing up in church every Sunday, taking whatever the preacher says as gospel. They don't read the scriptures. Evangelical Protestants do better. 63% read it at least once a week. Only 18% seldom and never. If you're going to understand the scripture, you actually got to open it and read it. Second, we need to stop reading the Bible in this truncated way, like a series of tweets that we fire back and forth at one another. We need to see the whole thing. We need to read it the way that Jesus and Paul and the early church read it, as a whole narrative. When they received it, it it was a scroll, and most people couldn't read, and so the scroll was always read out loud in the midst of community in the congregation, read as a whole, not as exposition of verses. I taught a little course up at Denver Seminary where they learn an expository preaching method, which has a lot of value to it, but you can get crazy with that sometimes. Like, you can get so lost in the, in the trees that you miss the forest. I asked one of the guys what he was preaching on. He said, well, he said, I'm doing a 26-week sermon series on the furniture in the temple. <laughs> and I thought, really? How big is your church? What's well, about 25? Yeah, that might have something to do with it. Look at the forest. Look at the broad sweep of Scripture. We can get so lost in the detail. We need to look at the whole thing. When Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples on the road to Emmaus who he is, they don't know who he is, they don't recognize him. Jesus kind of plays with them a little bit, and he comes up behind them. What are you talking about? Well, you know, Jesus, they tell us he rose from the dead. We're not sure what's going on. And and he says, well, you fools, you, you, you haven't really read the Scriptures. And so it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he told them all the things about himself in the scriptures. See, if you want to know who Jesus is, you've got to read the whole thing. I mean, it's in vogue today for Christians, particularly some megachurch pastors, to say that some parts of the scripture are more important than others. Andy Stanley, for example, said we ought to unhitch the Old Testament from the New. Hmm. Or another preacher in the Methodist tradition says we should have buckets that we put different scriptures in. Stuff that God meant to say always, stuff that used to mean something but doesn't mean anything now, and stuff that God never meant to say. Well, who gets to decide who goes in the bucket? You might kick the bucket. That's what we call Marcionism, though. Marcion was an early 
heresy, uh, heretic who, who, uh, who said we ought to get rid of the Old Testament. But notice how many times in the New Testament Jesus quotes the Old Testament and uses it as the ground for his ministry. We saw that just in Daniel. And so for us to be a church who understands the gospel, we've got to be a church that is reading Scripture well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. We have to be able to tell the whole story in the way that Jesus does. And that's one of the keys to our vision, to become a church that is theologically grounded in its primary sources, a church that reads the Scriptures and studies the Scriptures. And to do that in a different way than perhaps we've learned to do it in the past. Glenn Powell, many of you know, he's preached here before. He's the president of the Institute for Bible Reading. And they've done kind of an amazing thing where they, they decided to, to, to put together a, a new version of the Bible, not new content, but a new way that it's read. They put together a Bible called the Immerse Bible, which took all the chapters and verses out of it. And it causes you to read the scripture the way it was originally intended to be read, as a whole. And I, we've been using this, some of us on the staff, for the last several months. i got to tell you, it is powerful to read the scriptures in this way and read them in community together because this is the way it was first received. We see complete thoughts. We see how things connect. We don't just read parts of Romans. You read the whole thing. You begin to understand that Paul's argument is much bigger than we might have imagined. We read the parts of Scripture you may normally skip over. To read Haggai and Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Lamentations. Oh, who wants to read that? It's so depressing. Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff in there. And so what we want to do as part of our vision is to put some some legs on this and say, in order for us to become a Bible reading church, we want to be a, a church that gives you the tools to be able to do that. And so we're proposing an experiment that starting in January, we as a congregation are going to engage in the experiment of reading the Bible together, the entire New Testament in 16 weeks. Reading a few pages a day, and if you don't like to read, we also have an app that will read it for you that you can listen to driving to and from work, okay? An opportunity to read through the entire New Testament in 16 weeks. And we'll preach to support that and we'll give you background and all that kind of stuff. But to say, man, I, I read the New Testament and I begin to understand it. And then, you know, we'll take a break and then, then in the spring we'll do another section of the Bible in the same way. And over three years, everybody in the church, if they engage in this, will be able to say, I've read through the entire Bible, even the weird parts. My guess is when we do this, something very powerful is going to happen. People are going to begin to wake up to what God is actually up to. That our understanding of God is not just contained in a few verses. Most people say, well, John 3.16, that's it. Well, John 3.16 has a context because a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to say. This is a fantastic opportunity. If you've read the Bible before, this is a great opportunity for you to read it in a new way. If you've never read through the whole Bible, what a great New Year's resolution to begin this process. And we want to invite our community to join us. I mean, there are a lot of people who are not even in churches, but who want to understand the Bible. Recent Barna survey said that two-thirds of Americans are Bible curious. They want to know what's in the Bible, even if they don't come to church. Wouldn't it be cool if we had people in our community following along with us as we were reading through the Scriptures? If we want to be a church that thrives, it begins with an encounter with God in His Word. People find their story when they find God's story. To see how God has laid claim on our lives out of His love. And it's not just about knowledge, but about transformation, about training us in righteousness. And it's about community. When we read the Bible together, it begins to shape all of us. I mean, we did this experiment. We went through the Gospel of John as a church. We went through the book of Daniel as a church. Now, what if we did the whole thing? Tradition is vital, 
how the church has developed with creeds and statements, its worldview. We're going to dive into that tradition next week and what it means for both us and, and uh, what it means for our worship. But everything for us begins with God's word. Our vision for 2020 begins with an invitation to encounter it. And you can start practicing that now. You don't have to wait for January, by the way. Um, every Sunday, we put in the bulletin a daily reading list that supports what we've talked about in the sermon. I hope you take that bulletin home with you and use it. Use the prayer guide. Look at the questions. Gather a small group of people. Maybe you do it at the dinner table. Maybe you have a couple of friends you meet with. I know we have a couple of groups that do that already. We want you to be immersed in the story of God because the Spirit of God is at work in the Word of God. It's the means that God uses to communicate his love, his will, his purpose for you. To be people of the book. John Wesley said definitively, my ground is the Bible. Yea, I am a Bible bigot. I follow it in all things, both great and small. That's a vision that is clear. May it be our vision as a church as well. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word. That you are not a God who we have to speculate about, but rather you have revealed yourself to us, not only through the written word, but also in the person of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to encounter and embrace your word. To see how it will transform our lives. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. 